Good afternoon, everybody. This is Al Blumkin on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. We're here today with David Nemec and Ian Kahanowitz doing another chapter of, uh, of baseball history and David Nemec's all-time baseball history and trivia. Today we're going to uh, do uh, the years 1940 through 1946 and stop uh, uh, just before Jackie Robinson uh, comes up and revolutionizes the whole game in 1947. We're uh, going to 1946 because that's the first year that uh, all the uh, players were back from uh, World War II, and uh, there were some ramifications coming out of that season. So welcome, gentlemen. Hey, welcome. welcome Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Okay, David, uh, I'd like you to start on 1940 because your Indians uh, My, probably should have won the American League pennant that year. They the definitely pennant. should have won. Uh, they were called the crybabies, and rightfully so. Uh, they were a very talented team. Uh, a uh, feller was really starting to reach his peak. Uh, they had Boudreau on short, Keltner on third. Uh, the makings of a really good team. And uh, But they had trouble with their manager, Ozzie Vett, who was uh, not a great manager and tended to blame players publicly whenever they made errors or did something that uh, met with his disapproval. And they took their grievance to the owner, uh, Alva Bradley, in midseason, they wanted they wanted Vitt fired, and Bradley said no. I mean, you know, he's the manager. You guys play. And um, so, as a result, they finished out the season, and they were right. They were still in contention going into the last weekend of the season, and they had two games at home versus the Tigers on Friday and Saturday and Sunday, and they needed to win both. And uh, the Tigers came in with a one-game lead. On Saturday, Cleveland pitched their ace, Feller, and the Tigers gave up the game. They just said, you know, we're going to go, go for broke on Sunday. We're saving all of our staff for then. So they started a 30-year-old rookie uh, with very little experience at the big league level, Floyd Gibell, and uh, pretty much, you know, settled for the fact that he was probably going to get pounded. They were going to get out of the game, but they'd have their – their you know their aces intact for the sun for the Sunday game, and Gabell beat Bob Feller, shut him out. I think it was one to nothing, and that clinched the pennant for Detroit, and sent uh, the Tribe fans home unhappy uh, for the you know that have been ever since 1920 since they'd won a pennant. They'd come close a couple of times, pretty good pretty good teams, but this was the year they really should have won. Uh, but they had uh, they had some great ball players. They had Jeff Heath, and Heath happened to have a miserable year in 1940. Uh, would have a great year in 1941 if they'd, it had been the reverse. Cleveland definitely would have won the pennant and gone to the World Series against the defending National League champion who'd repeated the Cincinnati Reds. And I know you, I, both of you had something to say about that team. First of all, before we start on the Reds, the Yankees only finished a couple of games out in third place. And they had Frankie Crusetti playing shortstop all year. And he became one of the rare players to have over, over uh, 500 at bats and hit under 200 for a season. He hit 194. And uh, Phil Rizzuto was hitting 307 in Kansas City his last year in the minor leagues. And I have no idea why the Yankees kept playing Crescetti, who was obvious couldn't hit at all, and did not bring up Rizzuto uh, in that situation. That's always something that uh, you know, has mystified me. Was that Crescetti's last year as a regular? Or? Yeah, I think it was last year as a regular. Yeah, he, he, yeah. he, he yeah, played uh, when Rizzuto went into the Army. Well, that yeah, that it. I I had uh, I had forgotten about the Yankees being right there too until almost the very end. I don't know whether it was McCarthy or whether it was Barrow or who who was responsible for that. But that that, that decision, I think, uh, 
possibly cost the Yankees the flag. Well, anyway, we'll go into Cincinnati, and Cincinnati, uh, for years, until they put the Ernie Lombardi into the Hall of Fame, that this was the only team to have won, won a World Series without a Hall of Fame player. They had some good ones, like McCormick, Frank McCormick, and uh, uh, Ivor Goodman, and uh, pitcher, the base pitchers were uh, uh, Bucky Walters and Paul Derringer. And they were coming back from the 1939. They wound up beating the Tigers in the World Series in seven games. It was a very, a very good series, very competitive well, series, got, one of the I better series. Hurt. They put a backup catcher named Jimmy Wilson. I uh, played the whole series uh, for them, and uh, uh, he did very, very well. Yeah, that was one of the that was one of the most remarkable World Series stories, and it's sadly neglected today. Few people um, talk about it, let alone remember it. And uh, yeah, I remember as a kid how that always caught me, uh, the, the Wilson story. Yeah, and that team also had the uh, backup catcher for most of the season was Willard Harshberger, who wound up uh, committing suicide and. A hotel room in Boston because he uh, thought that uh, the pitch call that he made that was hit for a home run wound up losing the game. Yeah, that was a very tragic story. Ian, do you want to add anything to this? Well, you know, you had Willard Hirschberger uh, who um, who did kill himself, like we mentioned, and uh, that's because um, he was the best over um, a double header. Um, they, the Reds lost both games, and uh, he didn't uh, hit many of the games, uh, Hirschberg. And, um, you know, he was he very depressed. And, of course, uh, Gabe Paul, who was at the time the um, traveling secretary, called Hirschberg as a uh, makeup class here in Boston. Austin, and then they went to see. Uh, then um, a couple of the guys went to go see what happened. And, uh, but even more so, two other players, I think, tried to commit suicide um, on the team. Um, it's all in a book uh, called um, The 1940 Cincinnati Reds, a World Championship in Baseball Only. Um, uh, there are uh, three suicide attempts on the box. It's written by um, Morgan, I think, Brian Mulligan, and uh, it tells the whole story of the 1940 Reds. The two two other players in the Reds commit tried to commit suicide that year. Yeah, yeah, that season. Yeah, because one of the I've oldest, the most. That. Yeah, I know. It's uh, it's um, this. The, who were who were they? Um, let's see. It's um, no Perry and Warren Giles, the managers who together led the Reds. Um, the stories of players of the pennant winning team. Let's see. It doesn't cover it. Both the players. Well, it doesn't tell me here, but it said three people tried to uh, kill themselves. Hirschberger succeeded. You know, who's uh, also uh, on that team? Wow. After, if, they, if they tried before Hirschberger, I mean, by that time, the team should have been on total suicide watch. You know, who's also on that team, believe it or not, Eddie Juiced. Eddie Juiced, yeah. yeah. Later, again, yeah. ten years later, he was the regular shortstop for the uh, Philadelphia A's and was the last Philadelphia A's manager in 1954 before they uh, before they went City. to uh, yeah. And that yeah, Juice was had a, Juice had a long career and, and a very interesting career, and uh, you know, Cincinnati didn't have him that year, but they they got they had him uh, later. Uh, really one of the finest shortstop of, of the era, but he couldn't hit. It was Eddie Miller. He was there in 1940. Was he in 1940? Yeah. yeah he went to the Braves and hit 185 in 1943, I think it was. And then he went to the, when he got to the A's, he had a year in 1947 where he had the worst, uh, you know, average. No, no, I mean, I was talking about Miller. Miller didn't hit. Miller, Eddie him. Miller. Yeah. Yeah. No, was, was Miller with the Braves in 40? Huh. And uh, let's go to 1941, which is a very wild year. 
and uh, the Dodgers came out of uh, you know years and years of doldrums to win the National League pennant, and they were powered by uh, uh, Pete Reeser. Okay, and the story how Reeser came to the Dodgers is uh, very very uh, wild. Uh, he was on the Cardinal farm system, and uh, Landis freed a whole bunch of Cardinal farm hands in 1938. And the only one that Ricky was interested in retaining was Pete Reeser. So he called up McPhail and said, sign him, and then we'll work out a deal where you send him back to us. And McPhail owed Ricky a number of favors. So what happened was in 1940, Reeser went to spring training with the Dodgers. And DeRosa fell in love with him and wanted him for the Dodgers in 1940. And McPhail came up with all sorts of excuses why he couldn't bring him up. and sent him to Elmira in the Eastern League where he tore up the Eastern League. And uh, the Dodgers were forced to bring him up in 1941. And uh, McPhail called Ricky and says, if I trade him to you, they'll kill me in Brooklyn. So he didn't. And they, they made a trade where the Dodgers got Ducky Medwick from the Cardinals. And the Dodgers sent over, who were fairly cash poor at the time, sent over something like $100,000 to the Cardinals. And what that was was a payment for reason. Yeah. So they won the pennant for the first time in 21 years. And uh, over in the American League, of course, you had the two biggest uh, you know, hitting feats uh, in the last 75 years. You had uh, the Maggio, John DiMaggio hitting in 56 games, and uh, Ted Williams hitting 406. And the Yankees won the pennant by a block, and then, of course, they beat the Dodgers in the World Series. Most famous play, of which was the Mickey Owen best third strike. Mr. Shrek, yeah. But there was another hitting feat in America. Yeah, anybody want to go into the Williams 406 season, go to the Bonaggio 56 straight games? Well, there was, there was a third hitting feat that, that's kind of gotten buried away, and that's uh, it, uh, Jeff Heath became the last American leaguer after his terrible year in 1940 to have at least 20 doubles, 20 triples, and 20 home runs in a season. Well, actually, George Brett, I think, was the last American leaguer to do it. But prior to prior to Brett, I think uh, Heath was the, has the only, been the only one in the last seventy, seventy-five, however many years it's been. Uh, and he had a great year in forty-one. But Williams was going, you know, went into the last day of the season, hovering around the four hundred mark, and he could have sat out the last two games and finished. At, I think he was he, was in he exactly at four hundred going into the. Uh, it would have been rounded. 3.99 and a fraction, but it wasn't a high enough fraction to give him round to 400. To rounded. Yeah, high enough to be rounded. So he could have sat out the last two games. Uh, they were against Philadelphia. They were meaningless games, except for for what, whatever Williams did in the in the two games. But he elected to play, and he played in both. And he what, what did he go like six for eight, seven right, for yeah. nine? Or fantastic, yeah. fantastic finale. And, you know, to hike your average six points in one day uh, at that stage of the season, it, it may have, you know, it, uh, I don't think there's been a batting race or any, a batting, you know, feat ever since or even before uh, as remarkable as that in the last day of the season. And uh, he, of course, uh, you know, did not win the MVP award. Instead, it went to Joe DiMaggio. Uh, for his 56 game hitting streak, uh, even though it's remar- his streak was remarkable, he had a lot of help along the way. Uh, from I, th- I thought from official scorers, from what I've read, and uh, I think Williams' 406 as a result has never gotten uh, the attention and reward that it's due because I think that's one of the, really one of the most remarkable feats in probably ever in baseball history. Given yeah, well, how hard it was to hit 400 after after the 1930s started to fade away. After the Maggio was stopped by Cleveland, uh, 
uh, he hit in 60 in straight games afterwards. So he actually hit in 72 out of 73 games. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, but both the races were fairly, uh, you know, pen races were fairly one-sided. And uh, this was the first time that the Yankees and Dodgers were beaten the World Series, which would be uh, be a uh, occurrence uh, more and more Almost frequently annual. as uh, we go on. And uh, it was also noted because uh, both uh, Hank Greenberg uh, was went into the military in, in the beginning of the season, and he came out on December 5th. December 7th was Pearl Harbor. And that had a tremendous effect. Uh, in fact, one of the effects that uh, most people don't remember is that the St. Louis Browns were supposed to get a vote the day after on December 8th of their application to move to Los Angeles. Of course, with the attack on Pearl Harbor, that went totally by the boards. Do you have anything to add? You know, it's funny because now we're into World War II. And, hey, we, we got uh, some extra uh, fans out there. Yeah, um, we do. Yeah. <laughs> he has something to say. He has something to contribute. And yeah, hey. But um, but I, coming I, I up. Understood, I understood him. Yeah. Hey, that's that's all that counts. We have good fans here. Yeah. You know, he does, yeah. They don't have to be human. Um, the thing is, um, we have Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, through all this, um, saying uh, to Judge Landis, look, I think we should keep baseball going because they're going to cancel the season. Uh, you had 500 major leaguers going to uh, trade in their baseball uniforms into khakis and go fight World War II. But it, Roosevelt gave the green light to Judge Landis, and uh, they kept uh, baseball going. That's the biggest thing uh, that came out of it. And I think Ted Williams' 406, DiMaggio's 56-game uh hitting streak um, was one of the reasons why, um, you know, baseball kept going because of those feats, because attendances were returning uh, post-depression. Uh, and I think that uh, Roosevelt wanted, the main reason is wanted people to keep their minds occupied and off the war uh, at the home front. Another milestone that uh, uh, happened that year is that Ruffy Grove won his 300th game. That was his last season in the major leagues when he was pitching for the Red Sox, and he would be the last one to do that until uh, uh, early when Warren Spahn did that in 1963. Yeah, it was a huge gap between uh, Grove and, and Spahn and Wynn. It was the biggest, you know, biggest in, in history to that point. Oh, excuse me. Uh, one one in 61. Excuse me for that. One got 300 in 1961. My mistake. Hey, David, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. No, no. And yeah, another, another, uh, I, I'm not sure he did it in 41 or not. I think he did it in 42. But, uh, the last 3,000 hitman. Yeah. For a long time was, was Paul Wainer. I think he achieved it in 41. In 41, he began the season with the Dodgers. And, uh, he was nearing the end and he was in his late 30s. And I think he was, I don't know if he's wearing glasses then or he started wearing glasses a little bit later. But he was no longer the player he had been. He'd been a very formidable hitter throughout the 30s and the late 20s with the Pirates. And he achieved his, his I think he 3,000 hits actually in 1942. But it would be a long time before anybody got 3,000 again. Uh, there was quite a gap there, too. The next one was a... Uh, a uh in the major leagues when he did that in 1942. He came up as a rookie in September of 1941, and would go on to be one of the greatest hitters ever, uh, a rookie from the North Pennsylvania by the name of Stan Musial. And he would be the Who, yeah. that in 1958. And interestingly, the um, of the original 16 franchises, there was... Uh, there was a, there was a book, a very popular book in the 50s, uh, the greatest teams in baseball, and it took the 16th uh, 
you know, each franchise designated its best team in its history to that point. I think the book came out around, I don't know, 52, 53, somewhere in there. And uh, it, although it was a war year in 1942, because a lot of players already were starting to disappear from the scene, uh, the Cardinals' best year t- uh, when the book came out was 1942. They had a magnificent team that year, and they, and they had and they kept many of their players intact throughout the war, uh, including Musial, who played through '44, and the Cooper brothers, and they became a very very powerful team during the during the war, and came fairly close actually to, to winning four straight pennants. 1945, we'll get to it in a few minutes. Uh, they were in contention for quite a bit of the season and could have could have. Could have become, uh, you know, national, last National League team to uh, win four straight pennants. Well, the, uh, the Cardinals, uh, the Dodgers blew a uh, something like a nine-game lead in August. The Cardinals went right by them, not unlike what would happen in 1951. And the Cardinals wound up winning 106 games to the Dodgers 104. One of the things that happened with the Dodgers that uh, uh, about halfway through the season, Pete Reza ran into the first of uh, his uh, many differences with Walls, and he was yeah. uh, not cold, and uh, he was hitting 380 at the time, and he was rushed back by McPhail, and he was never the same. He finished the year with a 310 average. The Dodgers wound up blowing the pennant. And Ricky, when they asked Ricky about the reason, he said that bastard, being McPhail, shouldn't have been trusted with a jewel that fine. They never, they never spoke to each other after that. Well, you know, Reeser played. He play, you know, he played a full season in 1941. Yeah. And that was his only full season, yeah. really, in major all in all of his major league career. Uh, he, he played over 100 games in '42 and. Uh, you know, 46 and 47, but he was, he always missed like 30 or 40 games in those seasons. And then after 47, uh, he was no more than a part-time player. His career, you know, at a very early age, uh, when it was, went into eclipse and it was a very sad story. One of the saddest, yeah, I think, saddest. They had, they, they, they brought a priest out to conduct less rights. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, there's a biography that came out on him a number of years ago that I had that really details. It's one of the baseball's sad stories. Meanwhile, the American League, the Yankees won again. Uh, Joe Gordon, who was the Yankees' second baseman, playing next to Phil Rizzuto at shortstop, was voted the MVP. And uh, Ted Williams on the Red Sox had won the triple crown and hitting the first of his two. And Gordon, uh, uh, that was the first time that basically the uh, feud with Williams and the Riders at that point came to, uh, uh, you know, a boil because uh, he did not get the MVP after winning the heavy triple crown. Yeah, Williams really, you know, when you look, when you look back on it, really should have had at least two, maybe three more MVP awards than he got. And, you know, I think, you know, he's probably, the, uh, as a result, you know, is more deserving even than he and than he has, you know, all the accolades that have been poured on him. He deserves even more. I mean, he was an extraordinary, extraordinary ball player, hitter, fairly one-dimensional, was never a great fielder, never a great base runner, but... uh was so good with a bat in his hand that, uh, you know, I think every, mo- most people who really followed the game closely for the last 50 or 60 years think he was probably the best, maybe the best hitter of all time. Hey, you want to weigh in on that? You know something? Whenever you, um, whenever you listen to Ted Williams talk and uh, while Joe DiMaggio was alive, um, Williams always admitted you know, that he was the greatest hitter um, ever uh, in the game. But the best player he thought ever, all-around player, was DiMaggio. There was a book published a few years ago, The Kid. I forgot the author 
uh, Eclipse's name. Bradley. Bradley. Yeah. Bradley. Yeah. Yeah, it's about 800 pages. And I have the book. I have the book on my shelf. It, it took him 10 years to write the book. Um, again, you have to understand Williams. He came from California. Um, he had Mexican blood in him. People, a lot of people don't know that. And so he was always a leery, a little leery of his, um, you know, Mexican descent, uh, you know, heritage. And he never really got along well with the writers up here in Boston. Um, he thought that they were against him. He didn't like uh, that they always compared him to DiMaggio. And then, of course, Mickey Mantle, by that time he was older, but uh, he still played to 1960. Uh, but I think Ted Williams um, probably, I have to agree with Dave, it probably was the best hitter. I would even go so far to put him, I mean, Babe Ruth's in a category of himself. Lou Gehrig is up there, but I think he would be. He wrote The Science of Hitting in 1963 or four, I think, Ted Williams. Um, not enough can be said about uh, what he did for baseball up here in Boston, although they never won a championship until uh, 2004. Yeah, well, my so you have to also take into account how many years he lost to military service. It wasn't just Seven. World War II. It also was the Korean War. Uh, it impacted heavily on two of his seasons in, in the 1950s. So he lost really the equivalent of about four, four and a half, five seasons. And I think all he played quite six games before he went. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then you know it's uh, so he could have had he could have even though he didn't get three thousand hits he could have had well over three thousand didn't he get he didn't get three thousand hits. No, no. No, so he could have had but he could have had probably. 36, 3,700 hits easily, maybe even, you know, and if he'd, if, if he'd gotten that high, uh, in the time, in time Williams played, players, players retired fairly early and he went out in a high note, hitting a home run in his last at bat. But, uh, in today's game, uh, you know, if Williams had followed Pete Rose instead of preceding him, uh, and not had the military service interruptions, who knows? I mean, he could have been a DH, he could have been anything. And probably gotten well over four thousand hits before he called it called it quits. Well, uh, to finish off nineteen forty two, which was the last year uh, that uh, a no, quite a number of the real baseball players uh, played before they went into the uh, military for uh, World War Two, the Cardinals uh, managed to beat the Yankees in five games in the World Series, and that was a uh, uh, they won after the losing the first game. game. The opening game, and that was a big shock. And then by uh, the time 1943 rolled around, uh, most of the uh, top, almost all the top best players, were serving in the military one way or the other. Unless they had a deferment or a 4F, and, and there were some great players who did, like Mel Ott, who played all throughout the yeah, throughout the war right. years. Number them that uh, Woodrow did too. He had bad ankles. Bob, I think you know there there were there were a couple of others. Uh, Med, did Medwick play throughout the Warriors? I think he did. Yeah. And the trivia answer to the National League that had the most uh, I think the most RBIs for the 1940s was Bob Elliott. <laughs> was a good he's a good ball player. Yeah. But so 1943, I think, and I think that was the year of the green light. And uh, they they started that year with some sort of crazy baseball called below the ball, which is impossible to hit. For any po- with any power, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was it was uh, a ball that was comprised of uh, reclaimed cork and balata, whatever balata is which were two suitable materials that were not needed in the war effort. So they changed the ball because of the war effort. Yeah, one of the things that started to uh, uh, proliferate because of the war was uh, when it was night baseball because uh, there were people working in the plants that, uh, you know, couldn't get out during the day. So as more teams put in uh, lights, they, they started scheduling more night games. And the quality of uh, baseball went uh, down fairly uh, fairly heavily in 1943, 
I mean, it would have hit its uh, bottom until uh, 1944 and 1945. But, uh, you know, the Yankees and Cardinals would uh, get back into that World Series, the World Series again, and the Yankees would turn the tables on the Cardinals and beat them in five games. Frankie Crescetti uh, reclaimed the job as the regular shortstop for the Yankees when uh, Rizzuto went into the Navy. As Rizzuto There's an Navy. example of how, you know, the ball impacted on 1943. Yeah. Uh, the National League leader in home runs that year had a not not a great number, but he, a fairly decent number of home runs. He had 29. Bill Nicholson, Swish Nicholson, an outfielder with the Cubs. But the drop off from there, there were no other players in the National League with 20 home runs. Uh, Mel Ott finished second with 18, and Ron Northey of the Phillies, a uh, pretty good power hitter in his own right, and it would factor in the late 40s, had 18. So uh, we're we're down almost in not not in dead ball figures, but in figures that hadn't been seen since the early 1920s for uh, the leaderboards in home runs. And the American League didn't do much better. Uh, Vern Stevens led the league one year. Nick Nick Etten, uh, first baseman with the Yankees, led another year, but with very very low totals. And uh, home runs were home runs were infrequent. Uh, it, it was not a hitter. It was not a hitter's, hitter's paradise in any, by any means in the 1940s, in the early Yankees, 40s. Uh, Yankees uh, they had the uh, league's MVP that year. It was a pitcher by the name of Spud Chandler who went 20-4. and four. He was named the American League Most Valuable Player in 1943. And the uh, uh, Saint, uh, Stan Musio, only in his second full season, uh, was that in the National League, and I was the first of his three MVP awards. And in 1944, there was an excellent book that came out quite a number of years ago called Even the Browns. By Great William book. Lee. And the St. Louis Browns, who were uh, pretty unsuccessful for their entire history, somehow managed to uh, uh, put together a team of four reps, gray beards, and other uh, you know, nondescript ball players and wound up winning the American League pennant. And they On the last day of the season. In the last week, and they faced the Cardinals, who were still, as David mentioned earlier, still powerful. Uh, one of the things I read in that book was that uh, uh, the draft boards in St. Louis had a very, very big supply of men. So uh, the, the ball players uh, on the, both the Browns and the Cardinals, who weren't 4F, who were subject to the military draft, didn't get call up, called up until uh, basically until 1945. And the Browns had uh, some wild characters. They, they had Vern Stevens, as you mentioned. They had, I think, Don Goddard, and Mark Crispin. And they had, yeah, Mark, yeah, Crispin, they had, and they... Uh... They had a very nondescript outfield. They had Milt Burns, Shep Labs. Uh, you know, uh, Labs had been a pretty good ball player before the war, but uh, had big holes in his swing. He was a power hitter. Uh, and they had a very, very nondescript catching staff. Uh, and their, even their pitching. No, the pitching they had this, uh, this alcohol. I think. Six or cocky, right? Yeah, Jakucki won the pennant clinching game. I think it was, wasn't it on the final day of the season. Yeah, yeah. I think it was. And they beat the Yankees. Didn't they beat the Yankees on the final day of the season? The Yankees weren't. Wasn't the, that the way the prime race shaped up. Prep contenders. I think I don't remember who the prep contenders were, but I don't think it was the Yankees. But, but they, no, I mean the Yankees weren't. They didn't. They. I mean they beat the Yankees head to head on the last day of the season. Detroit was in contention. They beat Detroit, but it came at uh, one game at Detroit, and the Yankees, I think, finished third. But uh, You mentioned Paul Weiner before, and he finished up uh, with the Yankees that season. There was a story that some fan yelled at him and says, Hey, Weiner, what are you doing out here? He said, The bad Joe's in the Army. Yeah. But that's it. They, 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 they would bring guys who hadn't played in the major leagues in 20 years and activate them. 
And the minor leagues, of course, came to almost a total stop during those seasons. Yeah, they de- they were depleted to only about eight. eight really, were only about seven or eight leagues uh, in operation, including then there was a Class E league. Of, uh, only year in history, a Class E league, I think, in 1944, that uh, closed shop after a couple of weeks. But, uh, you know, none of the players, I don't think any of the players who were in that league ever went on to do anything, uh, as I recall. And it, it, uh, yeah, it, it, baseball really was, uh, you know, the, the players, when you went out to see, you weren't seeing the same quality of ball at all. But uh, even in the high minors, you were seeing what in pre- prior to the war would have been like class B ball. But uh, still, there were some interesting stories, some interesting players. And, and the 1944 World Series pitted the Cardinals and the Browns playing in the same park, Sportsman's Park. And that's the last time in Major League history. And I'm sure that's going to continue to be the last time that uh, two teams two, met in the World Series played all the games in the same park. Yeah, the Browns actually won two out of the first three games. Before yeah. The- Last three, the Cardinals. Uh, I read that the Cardinals uh, had to, if they fell behind two games too much, says we can't possibly let ourselves lose to this team, <laughs> and they rioted themselves. And anything you want to add? I do. I want to step back to um, 1943 for a second because sure. we're, we're missing one big, very, very big caveat, and. Um, the big caveat is, uh, and I just want to mention a stat, uh, in the American League, the Yankees led the uh, league in 1943 with only 100 home runs. So you could see only 100, collectively they hit 100 home runs as a team in 43. But um, Brad Tricky and Phil Wrigley established the All-American Girls um, uh, Baseball League. Um, yeah, and, very and that, good, good, Ian, that we needed to bring that in. And I, it's very it's very important um, to talk about this. And of course, it's documented um, in uh, a league of their own, which is his 25th anniversary um, this year. I've been invited if they have um, the celebration to Rockford, Illinois, because Maybelle Blair, who played on the teams, uh, I speak to her, Dr. Cat Williams, um, who teaches at Marshall University. She's sending me her book. I speak to Perry Barber, who has been an umpire for 38 years. Um, I talk to her almost every day. This begins a huge transformation with women. I had Leslie Heppy, who is the director of Sabre on Women's Study, on my show the other day. It should be published in a week or so. So I go through the whole history. This is when the Women's Baseball League becomes popular. And I think Wrigley... He's, you know, he was revolutionary for his, uh, for his day. You know, he, he was the chewing gum mogul, but he said, look, we need to bring people out to the park. The women have to look good. They have to wear short skirts. He gave a sex appeal um, to the game to bring not only female, um, you know, fans out, but that men would get, you know, interested. Um, and I always say the biggest thing that comes to my mind is how the hell do you slide when you're not wearing nylons and you're wearing a skirt, your whole leg will be ripped up to shreds. But these girls did it. Uh, and they, so they very were Im- under, yeah, they were, oh, they they did? were abbreviated pads under their skirts. Yeah, I mean, it, it was huge. This was huge. And, and it was so huge that they were able to get minor league teams out of it. They were able to foster and cultivate a huge following amongst the uh, girls that the um, – the league lasted well until 1954, and the only reason why it... Last years, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it lasted a long time. And they created the league because they were scared, you know, at the time. We're talking about January 43. Again, uh, what just happened, Stalingrad was going on. We didn't know if Russia was going to hold the city or not. Uh, the Battle of El Aliman with Montgomery in the desert just happened. They were pushing back. And we had just invaded North Africa, um, you know, to, to begin the war in uh, in uh, Western Africa. And in the Pacific, we were fighting a heck of a fight in Guadalcanal. So no one knew if we would need uh, more men. So they created the Women's League. And, again, 
a lot of things have to be said about it. It's a very important part of baseball history. Yeah, another another uh, cataclysmic event that happened was after 1942, Branch Rickey, and uh, who was feuding with the Cardinal owner Sam Breeden for a number of years, left the Cardinals and came to Brooklyn. He was able to come to Brooklyn because Larry McPhail uh, had, uh, who was in the 60s at the time, had enlisted uh, in the Army and uh, was serving in the military. So Ricky came to Brooklyn, and what he did uh, in Brooklyn was he started to sign minor league prospects. And the only, basically the only competition he had was the Yankees. So he was able to sign tons of minor league prospects while most of the other teams were uh, uh, contracting. And he was able to, you know, put together the uh, bulk of the uh, uh, team that would be known as the Boys of Summer during those years. This was basically the same thing he did with St. Louis exactly. when he came to the Cardinals. He, he developed the first really, really formidable farm system with the Cardinals, which made them the team, the strong team they were throughout the 20s and 30s. And he, he carried it over into Brooklyn. Yeah, you're right. That, that was... Uh, he did a tremendous job with Brooklyn's farm system. They had teams in almost every AAA league. They had a team. They had St. Paul in uh, the International League uh, or the American Association. Then they had it. Then they had who they have in the International League with Jersey Montreal. City or Montreal. Montreal, Montreal, right where Robinson went. Yeah. And uh, basically. Uh, Another thing he would do was he would get rid of all the Dodgers in 1941 and 42 had an awful lot of bad actors on the team. And Ricky wanted, uh, you know, wholesome, wholesome uh, players, and he managed to get rid of uh, basically the Kirby Higbees and the, uh, uh, you know, all the crazies that they had on the team and, uh, and uh, changed the whole uh, culture of uh, Brooklyn baseball. And uh, also, when we got to 1944, another uh, uh, colossal event was that Judge Landis finally passed in late 1944. And uh, his commission, obviously, his, uh, his race his commissioner ended. Now, do you, either of you guys put any stock into the uh, story that Bill Vack wanted to buy the Phillies? I do, I do. It's been, it's been it's been dismissed, but I I I don't uh, I, knowing Vec, I, I there was, there's more to it. I don't think the full story has ever really come out that he wanted to buy the Phillies and and install an all black team uh, in in Philadelphia during the war years. And uh, knowing Vec, knowing you know have, you know being from Cleveland and experiencing in the late forties. I think Beck was perfectly capable of doing exactly that. Uh, whether he ever really was given an opportunity to do it and could have ever done it, I don't know. But I do think he was thinking about it. Um, there's an article, gentlemen out there, if you ever want to read it, A Baseball Myth Exploded uh, by David Jordan, Larry Gerlich, and John Rossi. Uh, I've, which I've read which, that. It doesn't yeah. cover all the base. It doesn't, but um, even Vec in his own uh, autobiography, um, you know, he planned to stock it with, uh, you know, black baseball players. And circumstantial evidence proves that he probably would have by, of course, um, taking on um, Larry Doby and, um, you know, and uh, establish and establishing uh, it in the, in the American League as well. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, I think Beck was perfectly capable, but it really would have, it uh, would have been a shockeroo during World War II if he had done this. And it's too bad we'll never, we'll never really know whether he, what, what would have happened if he, if he'd gotten the opportunity, or whether he would have taken advantage of it, or whether it really was just smoke and mirrors. But I, I tend to think that he, he would have, he would have done it if, if he'd had the chance. And going back to the women's women's uh, All American Women's League, one thing we should talk about is the quality of ball they played. Initially, I think they were in the first year of '43. 
They were like fast pitch soft, as fast pitch softball almost. But they graduated. The ball became smaller, and they graduated graduated to overhand pitching. And they, they, I don't think that I don't think the mound was ever sixty feet six inches from home plate. And but the bases were ninety feet apart, and the, the field was pretty. You know, they, they used regulation fields. But correct me if I'm wrong. I think I think the pitching was a little short of the of the pitching of the professional pitching distance, uh, or the you know the men's the men's pitching distance of sixty feet six inches. I, uh, I, pitch, I'm not sure. The pitching the pitching on you are right, Dave. Was only forty feet from home plate, and the regulation. The first, yeah, for the first few years. Yeah. Yeah, but when they went to overhand pitching, I think they moved it back, maybe as far as 50 feet. They but did. I don't think they ever done that. They, they did, and then what happened is they had that, and then when they went to overhead, uh, they moved much closer um, to the 60 feet, 6 inches. I think it was uh, 56 feet or 57. It was, it was near. It was like 5 feet off, I believe. Okay, so that's – but even then, it was still a pitching-dominated game. If you, if you go back and look at the uh, statistics, uh, there were very, very few hitters in the three, uh, over 300 at the end of the season. And uh, there were a lot of hitters below 200. And uh, it was, it was uh, pretty much kind of a, almost a dead ball game and as, far as, the, as far as the scoring went and, you know, hunt and peck for runs here and there and – uh, there were a couple pretty big, couple pretty big hitters, but basically it was, it was a speed game, field, fielding game, base stealing game. Uh, it was a kind of a throwback game to the, what the, what the major league game had been in, in the dead ball era. Yeah, it, 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 they played the short ball. They played the small ball game. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's just one of those things, uh, what was the name? Dottie, um, I forget. Cam- I, I forget. She she was six months pregnant that she was pit- pitching. Um, these girls endured a lot, and don't forget there was a lot of rules of conduct that they had to fo- have to follow. They could not wear short hair. They couldn't smoke or drink in public places. They were required to wear lipstick all the time, um, and yet you know they they uh, were fined for every time they violated a rule. So. You know, stuff that happened in the 1940s would be discrimination in the, the year 2017. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting. You know, the Women's League really had an opportunity to really break ground if they had if they had uh, broken the color line. And there was a, a brief scene in a league of their own where uh, I can't remember who the stars were, uh, but the, the big star, Gina, what is it, Gina Davis or whatever her name Gina is. Gina Davis, yep, Gina Davis. Yeah, is uh, a ball a, a ball gets by her, I think, and she goes to retrieve the ball, and it's thrown back to her with with full force by a black woman. And I thought that was a comment on the fact that the game could, you know, the game did not break the color line, and it was sad. Because they had an opportunity, the same kind of opportunity the Players League had, to do all kinds of things, and they did a couple, but they never took full advantage of it in 1890 to really, you know, they could have played on Sunday, they could have broken the color line, they could have done all kinds of things then. They didn't, and the Women's League had that same opportunity, and I, I've always uh, been kind of saddened that they didn't take they didn't take advantage of any of that. And, and you know, it's funny because they had a victory song, which you could hear in the movie, but again, they leave African Americans out. They said, we are the members of the All-American League. We come from cities near and far. We've got Canadians, Irishmen, and Swedes. We're all for one. We're one for all. We're all Americans. But there's no African American. But it wasn't. Yeah, no. The 1945, I once read a, uh, a big story years ago. In 1945, it was called from, from Gray to Greenberg meaning Pete Gray, Pete Gray. one-armed outfielder. Yeah. Say, who had uh, some amazing success in uh, the minor leagues. Tri- Browns boy. Double A at Memphis. Yeah. 
I think it was Memphis or Nashville. Yeah, Memphis, yeah. Memphis, yeah, Memphis, yeah. Double A Southern Association. And uh, Pete Gray. Led the league in batting in 44. Yeah, he was totally disliked by his Browns teammates. And uh, he was not successful in the uh, major leagues. He hit 218, playing about 75 games or so. And supposedly he uh, destroyed, uh, helped destroy whatever morale the Browns had uh, coming over from the 1944 season. And uh, they did not win the pennant. And that's when really uh, Musio left uh, to go into the military. I think Bobby Dorr went in for that one year from the Red Sox. And uh, by the middle to the end of the season, certain the players started coming out. Hank Greenberg came out after being in there from 1941. Bob Feller came out uh, for the Indians after uh, going in uh, prior to the 1942 season. And they were yeah, he lost. Out. As David mentioned, the Cubs uh, – would make their last World Series appearance until uh, this past season, and they would play the Detroit Tigers. Hank Greenberg would uh, hit a uh, home run on the last day of the season to win the pennant for the Tigers. That was really. But you have you have to say something about who the Tigers beat out for the pennant. Yes, mm-hmm. very... They beat out the Washington Senators, and the Washington Senators had finished the season the week before everybody else because they had rented the stadium to the football Redskins. And their owner, Clark Griffith, never imagined he would have a contending team. Yeah. With the, the cast he had in 1945, it really, when you, look, when you look back and examine their roster, he was right. But nevertheless, they were right in there. Yeah, they had the four knuckleball stars that year, Dutch Leonard, uh, Roger Wolf, Mickey Hafter, and uh, Johnny Riggling, I think was the fourth one. Riggling, yeah. They started four knuckleball pitchers, which, of course, is, uh, you know, has never been duplicated. And what happened in the uh, World Series is that uh, the, uh, one of the sports writers said when he asked who he, he, who he liked to win the World Series, said neither. Warren Brown, yeah. Warren Brown of Chicago, and... Uh, that year, they gave special dispensation. Each team was able to add a player who did not participate uh, in the regular season. The Tigers put on Virgil Trucks, and the uh, Cubs put on a catcher named Clyde Bacola. Virgil Trucks would go on to win a World Series game and become the first pitcher to ever win a World Series game without having won a, game, a regular season game. The only other uh, one to ever do that was a pitcher... Uh, in the 1986 World Series for Boston, they, Steve Crawford was credited with the win in the second game of that series and had won a, won a regular season game that year. Yeah, well, Mc, and McCullough I don't, hadn't played a game so, oh. during the entire season, but played in the World Series. Which... Yeah, they, they were given, given special dispensation. That came up in a... Uh, uh, Facebook discussion recently on Virgil Trucks at the one fairly long. So the war ended in 1945, and all the real major leaguers came back in 1946. Oh, and that contribute. Well, you know, there's a book out there. Um, it's called The Victory Season. It was written by uh, Robert Weintraub. And he, yeah, very rec- good one. He recounts, you know, everyone waiting for all the players to come back uh, from, uh, the, you know, the war and just get back to a certain normal state of period, uh, like um, that they haven't seen probably since the 1920s of the Great Depression uh, and World War II, just, you know, for about 15, 16, about 18 years, the, the country was in uh, two uh, tumultuous battles. Um, a couple of sad things happened. Billy Southwest Jr., who was the first player in organized baseball to enlist for military uh, service, died on February 15th that year uh, when his B-29 crashed off the coast of Flushing, New York. 
Um, he had flown 25 successful missions in Europe and was the son of St. Louis Cardinals manager, Billy Southworth. So, um, you know, an accident off the uh, coast of uh, New York over here. Um, but they also canceled the 1945 All-Star game. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, um, you know, it, it's, uh, attendance, um, attendance rose to a staggering 10.28 million break in the 1940 record. The Tigers, as we mentioned, they were in the World Series, topped the list with 1.28 million. And the Brooklyn Dodgers, New York Giants, and Chicago Cubs came in a close second with 1 million fans each. So you see, everyone wants to get back to baseball. And, um, the war had its effect that we mentioned throughout the show, but uh, now we're going to be seeing big changes in the upcoming years. You know, there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of players who came back. Uh, you have players like Ted Williams, uh, and Stan Musial didn't miss a beat. There were players. The Maggio, John Maggio, had a weak year in 1946, but the saddest story uh, coming out of there was the uh, Washington shortstop by the name of Cecil Travis. Yeah. Who uh, was a very, very uh, high average hitter before the war. In fact, in 1941, he had the second best average to uh, the, Ted Williams. He had 359. He went in and he was, his feet were frozen in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, he came back and he couldn't hit at all or move. Uh, move. Couldn't move. Couldn't move. Couldn't, at all. Yeah. He faded out after 1947. Uh, the Red Sox won the pennant that year. And the only time that Ted Williams and Dom DiMaggio and Johnny Pesky and Bobby Doerr would get into a World Series. And uh, the Cardinals beat the Dodgers in a two-game playoff. They had both wound up tied at the end of the season. And the Cardinals uh, beat the Dodgers in a two-game playoff in 1946. They advanced to the World Series. And they played the uh, Red Sox, and they beat the Red Sox in seven games. The seventh game is most noted for... Uh, you know, slaughters a mad dash from first base on uh, Harry Walker's, uh, who was credited with a double, even though he took second on the throw to home. Uh, and uh, the throw was off because uh, Dom, Dominic DiMaggio had gotten hurt the previous innings, and the uh, Red Sox put in a center fielder named Leon Culberson, who couldn't play with DiMaggio, and he, his throw was off. And uh, Slaughter scored uh, what turned out to be the winning run. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very controversial play. I mean, it, the throw was weak. There's no question of that. But you know, Pesky, Johnny Pesky, the Boston shortstop, was the relay man, and there was there was always talk that he hesitated, held the ball a little too long before turning, wheeling, and throwing to the plate. Uh, that's a matter of dispute. I mean, there's no no question that Culberson was not a really high quality. Uh, substitution for DiMaggio, but uh, the, the play was the play was controversial. But nothing controversial about Slaughter's dash. I mean, he was going all the way, and uh, it it uh, he scored. And that that was that was kind of the way he played throughout his career. He was a throwback player. Uh, we haven't talked about him much. Uh, we should because uh, he played a brand of ball that wasn't seen much in the in the at that time, uh, he was he hustled all out. Uh, he played with a lot of fire. He was a very scrappy, very hard nosed guy, and uh, had a long, long career uh, with not a great amount of talent, really. And eventually, he made the Hall of Fame. Oh, we'll end this with uh, one last statement of 1946 in the International League Royals of 1946 featured. Jackie Robinson, who uh, Branch Rickey had signed uh, the year before, and Brad Jackie Robinson would be the first player in the first black player in the major leagues since 1884 when you had the uh, Walker brothers. So next week we'll get into Jackie Robinson and the whole way baseball uh, change it would change over the next several years. Um, I have anything to add before we close? No, I think we I think we've covered such all the bases today. I have 
I have a few. Um, one of them is is that uh, we 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 have to at least mention um, Ethel Manley because her husband had died um, that year in '46, and she became the first female owner of the baseball club uh, with the Newark uh, Grays over there. Well, actually, no, Helen Robinson was the first yeah. owner. Oh. The owner. oh. That's right. I forgot about him. But yeah, uh, uh, there's the Newark Eagles. The Newark Eagles. At Monte Arthur and Larry Dolby among Leon Day, they had a, a pretty good team there. And uh, earlier in 1942, um, I think uh, Satchel Page uh, struck out uh, on July 21st. Struck out Josh Gibson on three pitches. Uh, which he made that prediction uh, years ago. Um, again, the Negro Leagues, uh, although they were depleted as well, I, again, you had all the lynchings going on in the 1940s. You had race riots in Chicago. Um, you know, the home front was still um, a hotbed of segregation, and now that African Americans are fighting into a war, uh, that is the most destructive war ever, they... Uh, the, the origins of um, civil rights are beginning to form underneath the Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, administration. Um, I know Eleanor Roosevelt was a huge, huge supporter of, um, of uh, civil rights. I forgot the name of the um, African-American singer they, they refused to have. Oh, Paul Robson. Oh, Paul Rob- oh, Robson. Yeah, and... Uh, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt got her to sing at the Lincoln Memorial uh, in 1939. Um, so you had um, you had a lot of strikes during the, the war. Where uh, I know up in Detroit in the uh, auto factory, um, you had uh, combatants between African Americans and whites. So you still had this tension. But in New York, a law was passed saying that, um, you know, basically said you could contract anyone. It didn't specifically disregard anything. Uh, and because of that law in 1945, Branch Rickey was able to get Jackie Robinson because of that law in New York. And I don't have the law in front of me, but um, he was put into Montreal for the 46th season. Also the uh, passing of Landis. Yeah. A lot to that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's conflicting with Landis. You know, Landis, uh, what we didn't mention was, um, we, we mentioned that the Brooklyn Dodgers cleared house. But Landis made an investigation and found that about 75 of the players there, 75% of the players were gambling, poker games and uh, all kinds of horse racings and stuff. And I believe Leo DeRocha, uh was, was – um, you know, part of it, and if he wasn't part of it, he turned a blind eye because he himself, uh, you the know. The Rocha, a ringleader. Uh, yeah. Know, not only part, but, uh, yeah, he, he fostered it and, you know, he was a manager, uh, a manager way, way out of his time by the 40s. He was more of a throwback too to the, you know, the kinds of managers that we had in the early days of baseball. Uh, like, you know, the McGraws oh, and, and by, about DeRosha that just came out by Paul Dixon. I, I got it in the mail the other day. I haven't started it yet, but it's supposed to be very good. I'm 150 oh. pages in right now. Okay. It's an excellent book. It's an excellent book. And I, I think that's his... I think that's his that was excellent. Yeah, he uh, wrote that about three years ago. This is his... He's going to be on my show in May to talk about the DeRosha book. Um... But the, the book is very, very good. It talks about uh, DeRoche's friendship with George Raft, and a lot of people don't know who George Raft was, but if you ever see the movie Some Like It Hot, oh, yeah. again, he, he's a little older. <laughs> he plays spats. Um, but uh, I always tell people to go see him in the 1930s. Uh, okay, you next know. week we'll get it to uh, 1947, the whole DeRoche, Ricky, uh, Robinson, uh, McPhail, that whole... Yeah, that's going to be a good place to begin. Okay, gentlemen. Thank you both. All right. Good night. All right. This is Alf Lumpkin on a Comfortably Zoom Radio Network. Same bad time, same bad channel next week. Thank you both. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.